Hello, everyone. Today we're going to talk about state machines and if they're worth it, and if there's another way. Uh, the answer is yes. Also, you notice that I'm using a pretty crappy PowerPoint presentation today. Um, that's because I'm currently pretty busy uh, making a game. Turns out making games is hard and takes a lot of time. So I don't have a lot of time for fancy video editing and such. Um, and I apologize for this meme. It's really dating me as a millennial. But I feel like a lot of people can relate to this when they first hear about state machines and learn about them. It's kind of like, okay, cool. What are they? Um, if you look up a state machine, you might see something that looks like this. And this doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Like what are the ones and zeros and whatnot? This is the like formal uh, state machine diagram. I learned about this in my electrical engineering undergrad. And basically it's saying we have four states, right? S0, S1, S2, S3. And you can move between these states by different transition conditions, which are given by these numbers here. Um, for video games, I think a diagram like this is going to work a lot better. You're going to be able to read it and see the transition states or um, the state. Rather than using state numbers, you can see what the states are. So this makes more sense. And in programming, you might do something like uh, make an enumeration and then each state is an enum enumeration and then you can, you know, so this is saying something like you're in an initial state and the door is locked. Um, if you insert a coin, you moved into the unlock state. I'll be honest with you. I have no idea what this is. Uh, you take a coin out, you put a coin in. I guess it's just saying that the coin does nothing in the unlo unlocked state. And then if you push the lock, it locks it again. And if you're already locked, then pushing it does nothing. So yeah, like there's, you know, state machines they clearly can represent um, ways to get in and out of situations and all this stuff. So this topic is probably gonna get me in trouble with a lot of uh, game developers because I'm noticing a trend where game developers are kind of like engineers where some of them fall into this thing where they say state machines, use them for everything. They're amazing for everything. Um, I've seen the same thing happen with engineers in the like process industry, manufacturing space where some engineers fall in the camp of saying you should use a state machine for absolutely everything. And then there's others that hate state machines. Um, there are some people like myself who operate in the middle and just make everyone mad at the same time. But in my humble opinion, state machines are really good for uh, continuous cycles, right? So I don't know if you picture like a water treatment process where you have to you know, open the gate first and let the water in, then turn on a pump and then dose the water and blah, 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 right? Um, you can step through those states um, very cleanly. And then at the end, you can return to the original state. And it's good when things get really, really complicated. Um, when your states or your process gets so complicated that you can't write conditional logic for it. Um, then state machines are good. You know, I've seen very good use cases of, of state machines. Um, let's talk about video games. Okay. That's what we're here for. Video games. Once again, my humble opinion, it's not good for this. If you have to click a single button, like the a button on your controller, um, it's not good for that because that is a discrete action. You click it and it either does something or it does nothing. Turns out there is a better way to do this. Um, and that would be a binary decision tree. And the reason that binary decision trees are good is at the end of the day, you either produce an action for that button or you do nothing. So you have a binary result um, that comes out of it. Of course, you can construct your logic with a series of like if statements and you kind of move through different possibilities to see what that action is going to do. So for my game, you know, obviously I have other controls like running around and, you know, stuff like that, diving, swimming. But the two interaction buttons I have right now are picking stuff up with X and also doing other stuff with that thing you pick up and then interacting, which I'm using the B button for. Let's jump right to Godot and see how would we do this um, in the game engine. One way to do it would be to have your player model, right, which is a character body 3D and then attach a area 3D to it. 
So I'm using the area entered and area exited signals on the body. Um, you might ask yourself, why are you using an area 3D? You're going to have a collision shape. Can you not use the body entered, body exited signals? And yes, in theory, that would be wonderful. However, it does not seem to work very well in Godot. And if you Google it, lots of people have struggled to use it. So what I do instead is I put an area 3D with a collision shape on my player model. Usually a very simple shape like a sphere, right? And then for the area entered and area exited, I'm just tracking all of the objects that my character interacts with. If it enters that object, I put it into a big array of area 3Ds that tracks it, right? If the object is not already there, then I add it to the array. I don't put multiple instances of the same object. It shouldn't be possible since you shouldn't be able to area exit, or sorry, you shouldn't be able to enter an area uh, twice for the same object, but let's assume you're putting in some safeguarding against possible engine engine bugs. Um, and then when you air, you know area exit, that item gets removed from the from the list. So basically, you have a running list of all the things that your player is currently touching or the area 3Ds are currently seeing. Um, how would you write code for this? So in your process function, and whether it's physics process or whatever. You write code for each action, right? So each A button, B button, X button, whatever, is gonna have a binary decision tree. Um, you continuously check the entered areas. Um, so this is pretty efficient. You're gonna do a for loop on that array. And obviously, if, it's, if there's one item in the array, then it's just one. But if you're touching two things at once, then you go through both of those. You do a binary decision tree to figure out what the action does. Then when you have the action, you display prompt on the HUD. And if the button is clicked, you know, use a mapping, then do the thing. So it's really that simple. Okay, so now for the fun stuff. Um, we are inside Godot here, and we're inside the game that I'm currently developing called A Beaver's Tale. Um, in this world, you run around as this little cute little beaver character. And probably the main thing you can do is build dams. So you interact with the dams, you pick up logs, um, you can cut down logs from trees and get more logs. Um, yeah, you can do you can do lots of stuff. Um, and there's also this little bucket, this little tap. You can extract maple syrup from the trees. So you can see there's like not a lot of objects in this world, but the number of things that you can do um, gets up there pretty quick. Like it, the complexity, yeah, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of complexity in here. So, um, let's just run around the world and I'll show you. If you go near a tree, then I get action on Q. I'm using a keyboard right now. If it were a controller, it would be B. Um, but if I use Q, then I can harvest, right? I can use up my energy to run around. Um, yeah. And that's, that's the basic tree mechanic. If there's a log here, I can press F to pick it up. And when the log is picked up, then I'm actually carrying it around. Um, I can drop the log, right? Um, if I am picking up the log, there's some things I can do. There's some things I can't do, right? So you'll notice that I come to the tree and there's no prompt anymore. And the reason is I can't do other stuff on the tree if I'm carrying the log. Um, can I talk to this little groundhog, this albino groundhog guy? Yes, yes I can. Um, do I want that? I don't know. I'm still working on it. Um, but you can kind of see all the different decisions. If I come near these objects, nothing happens. Uh, if I drop the log, then I can pick up this thing. If I drop that, I can pick up this thing. So you kind of see all the things. And then of course, like for the tap, um, this is a maple syrup tap. So you can, you know, you can stick it on the tree. Um, once you've, you know, dropped or attached that object, I can remove it again, or I can put it back on the tree and then I can harvest a branch, right? Because now I'm, my hands are free basically. Um, so, right. So I can harvest a branch and then I could pick up the bucket and come over here and attach it to the tree. And then, Oh, look, I have a maple syrup set up so I can actually, uh, extract syrup. And in this game, when you extract syrup from a tree that gives you energy to run around and go really fast, uh, which is fun. The other action, like I think the other main action is going to be diving so you can dive and swim around and you can come back up for air. Um, 
And then there's a whole thing about building dams, which I won't get into too much because it's kind of a separate mechanic. Basically, you just pick up the logs, bring them to the dam, drop them in, and there's like a certain threshold. I'll, uh, I'll show you real quick. So if you run up here and I have this log in my little beaver hands, um, there's supposed to be a dam here. I think I have it hidden right now. Yeah, so there's supposed to be a dam right there, but as you drop objects into it, you'll see this thing that says the first one on the left is 19%. Um, that's because I was doing some testing in the designer. But if I come in here and actually put on the, yeah, if I actually display this dam, you'll see it looks like this. And then when you're in the game, um, let me get back in there real quick. Then you see these little ropes and that kind of gives you a guide like, oh, I'm supposed to do something here. There's, this is, you know, there's these rope thingies. That's like classic video game um, hint type thing. <clears throat> so that's basically the actions in my game. And the way that they're implemented in code is I tried to do this as simply as possible because this is a small game. I don't want to spend forever on it and I don't want you're trying to hit a sweet spot, right? Because the code needs to be manageable, like it needs to be maintainable, but I don't want it to be so crazy complex that I can't understand it when I come back and read it. Um, so I have this areas script and let's do, let's fold all. And you'll see I have area entered, area exited. So on area entered, all I'm doing is I have a bunch of variables. I'm going to say, oh, did I en did a bucket enter the area? Did a tap enter the area? Did a tree enter the area? And this has some additional logic where I don't even allow it to enter the area if it doesn't have any branches remaining. I didn't show you, but if you cut down too many branches, then the tree turns into a little stump um, and then you can't extract any more from it, right? Um, Wireton Willie is the name of that little albino groundhog character. Um, and yeah, so this is basic way that the character body, you know, interacts with other areas in the world. Um, once things are in the entered areas array, which you will see somewhere here, uh, probably at the top. Yeah. Once it goes into this array, then I go to process and maybe let me just fold these for a second. Here are my actual decision trees, right? So the idea is this, once I get everything folded here, um, probably ignore this cause this is the damn logic and that's gets a little more complicated, but basically what I have is I have action one, action two, and I have these input mapped. So whether I'm using a joystick or I'm using the keyboard, it gets mapped in as those actions. And what I'm doing is for each action, I have a decision tree. And so, the first action we can look at is um, whether or not I want to pick up something, right? So the first question is, am I carrying an object or not? And of course, when I pick up an object, I set the carrying object. It's actually a reference to a rigid body, but that's, that's irrelevant. Um, if I am carrying the object, then that action is going to do some different stuff. But if I'm not carrying an object, that means that I can pick up something, right? I'm free to pick something up. Let's ignore the tree entered for a second because there's some additional logic here. But if I'm not carrying an object and if I'm not near the tree, then I have some more kind of basic logic for what I can pick up, how I pick it up. Um, the first thing I'm going to notice is that the log area 3D if you go down to my area entered code, I don't have an entry here for log area. Um, the reason is that you can be in the presence of multiple logs at once. So let me, let me show you that real quick. Um, so let's say I extract a bunch of logs from this tree. Um, so I'm going to harvest some, we'll just do maybe three for now. It'll take a, take a hot sack here. Okay. So there's my three logs. How do I actually know which one to pick up? Because let's say I had an, a log area entered variable. When I enter this area, that's great. That'll come into the area. But when I exit it, it's going to set it to null. And based on the timing of entering or exiting 
this log, you know, so let's say you have one here and you have one, I don't know, close by. You could, in theory, enter this area, enter that area, and I still haven't exited the previous one, but by the time I come over here, I'm exiting the previous one, and now that log area is null, which is a problem because I'm still next to this one. So the basic algorithm is like, if you're in the presence of multiple areas, then what happens is um, they all get added, right? They all get added to that array, that entered areas array. And then in my logic, what I do is I have a log entered null at the beginning of each process scan. And then I go through all of those areas and um, forget about this logic for a second. This is some additional stuff. Once it's built into the dam, we don't interact with it anymore. This basically, my comment here is get last. So it's always getting the last area, the last log area that was entered into that queue. Um, so it ensures that the player is always able to pick up the last thing that it touched, which is like really not an intuitive thing to think about. And you think that area entered area exit, you might be covered, but you would have a little bug there. Um, like I said, if you entered one, the area of one log, entered the area of a second log, and then exited the first area, you're going to actually set that log entered to null, and then you're going to be, you're going to be screwed. Um, so basically all I'm doing here is. If a log is entered, then I have this action one area that I set. If I'm not entering a log, then I have to go through the other things that I can pick up, right? Uh, if a I ha enter a tap, right, that little maple syrup tap, and the tap is not attached to a tree, uh, or if I enter a bucket and the bucket is not attached to a tree, then I set this action one area. Once that action one area is set up, then I set my action one to pick up, and I have a little highlight um, prompt here that indicates what object should be highlighted. So, I mean, the whole um, action, the logic for it's right here. Um, it's probably like 30 lines of code. Um, and it is, a, it is decision tree, right? So you do first think about, am I carrying an object? If I'm carrying an object, what does that action one do? Um, there's a couple things you can do. You can unattach a bucket or a tap if you're near a tree or you can drop an action, right? So going back to the game for a sec, if I press F again, it drops it, right? But if I'm near a tree, I don't necessarily wanna drop it. You know what I mean? And also there's gonna be a weird bug here because I'm gonna drop this object on top of another mesh and it's gonna clip through it. So I don't wanna let the character actually do this. Uh, the beautiful thing about the binary decision tree is that it does that for me. Like it's handling that logic by default because I haven't defined an action. Right. If you look at this, if my tree is entered and I'm carrying an object, I don't define an action for dropping it. Not in that state. As soon as I leave the tree, I can drop it. No problem. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Um, there's the second action here. So I think this decision logic is much simpler. Right. Uh, this is the action for diving. This is the action for um, doing extracting syrup and then harvesting branches. Now, the obvious question is, you know, could you do this with a state machine? Yes. Um, do I want to have to write out a state diagram for all the states the beaver can be in and like how it interacts with the logs and the branches in these different states? No, honestly, I don't. Because if you look at this logic, I'm checking the state of these other objects dynamically, right? Um, let me just show you the harvesting mechanic real quick. Like if I'm harvesting branches here, so hold Q, um, I probably only get one more uh, or two more maybe. We'll see. It's a random distribution. So once I finish harvesting everything I can harvest from that tree, um, I get a little animation. The tree goes away. Now we see this little stump and I can't interact with this any longer. So I don't want to be able to harvest a branch if there's no branches remaining. And I don't want to have the complexity of a state machine to have to check the state of my beaver versus the state of the tree versus the state of the tap and the state of the bucket. I just didn't want all that. So I'm kind of presenting this as another option, right? 
Okay, so what do you do when you have that state defined? So at this point in the code, action one and action two are completely defined. Um, every single scan, every single uh, pass of process, we know what action one and action two are. Um, this little line of code here just overwrites action one if you're near a, talkable, a character you can talk to. So I might rework this later. I don't know if I love how that is right now, but um, obviously all you do is if you press the action one key that you've mapped, then you go through your different actions, attach, remove, drop, pick up. And I have functions defined for each of these, right? Attach bucket to tree, remove bucket, remove tap, drop object, pick up object, like make it as simple as possible. So when you create this logic, um, it, it's easy, right? Make it easy on yourself. And then we have is action just pressed on action two and then diving. There's logic there for diving. And then if action, uh, sorry, if is action pressed, then these are continuous actions. Like I need to hold them. So I do extract syrup on this action and then I do harvest log on this action. So um, it should be simple, right? And then I have a show HUD action. So at the end of all this processing, I show the actions on the HUD. Um, I'm doing a couple other things here. Like if I'm carrying the object, then I, you know, this function carries the object around. It does some other stuff. It sets it, puts the object on a different collision layer so it doesn't freak out. Um, it highlights, uh, sorry, it unhighlights the character because that was just a little annoying to have it highlighted. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, maybe this is helpful for you. Uh, if so, you know, please let me know in the comments. If you disagree with me, that's fine too. <laughs> I've experienced this thing many times before with state machines actually. So um, yeah, let's get into it. Let's talk about it. So thanks for watching and I will uh, see you guys next time.